mentioned, I've been doing operations in all four provinces of Western Canada for 15 plus years now. Um, so I was brought on board to, you know, they have this nice box, but what's the regulatory environment and how do people actually operate things in the field? And when you drop it out there, your operator is not going to roll his eyes and say, oh, great, another helpful engineer from Calgary showing up. So that's, uh, that's what I was brought in to help sort out. Okay, first of all, we, uh, I'm going to talk about the regulatory implementations and op opportunities. We all know that uh, EUB has had flaring restrictions for many years. Uh, BC and Saskatchewan are currently phasing them in. And I had a discussion with Manitoba government this week, and uh, they are evaluating them, evaluating. So they, that'll probably be coming down the pipe as well. Um, I'm going to talk about some logistics and other beneficial considerations or all the stuff that you never think of until you get the unit in the field. So, okay. So for ongoing operations, this is where the regulatory body says you have to do a decision tree every year and prove it's not economic to tie it. Now, but they dictate the rules of what's economic. In Saskatchewan, negative $50,000 is economic. They also dictate the price you have to use, the capital cost, and the operating expenses you can use. So as long as you're going to lose less than $50,000, you have to do the project. Alberta has similar things and so does BC, they just use different parameters and different amounts. So you have these wells out there, a little single well battery doing you know, 20 barrels a day and a 75 MCF a day of solution gas, which are four miles from a pipe gathering system. What do you do with it? You either put in four miles, depending on the economics, they'll force you to put it in even if you're losing money. So this would be an excellent opportunity for that. You bring in a unit like this, it would integrate with the existing two-phase separator on site, keep your same flare stack for emergency situations, and now you're producing an extra 10 barrels a day of product. Um, so if you don't have access to a gathering system, that can be um, you know, just the third-party system you need to tie in is full. Well, like I said, it's too far away. Um, parts of Saskatchewan, there's not a solution gas line for miles and miles. And uh, I think the Kindersley area and parts of southeast Saskatchewan are going to be really hurting as this phasing comes in. I know I was working at a place and we, there was an October 2012 deadline, was it? And I know we spud as many wells as we could before that deadline so we didn't have to climb in. Um, now, third party fees. The last time I tied in a oil well in Alberta, I paid a lot of money for the privilege of tying into somebody's gathering system and it cost me 50 cents an MCF to go through their compressor in the cleaning facility. And if I didn't do that, I couldn't produce my oil. So using this system, instead of tying in, that would enable me to generate revenue from this, this gas instead of it being an operations expense. Um, it's, and then it's flexible, you can go into the pipeline, you can run this, if the gas regime changes, this is all skid mounted, you just pick it up and go back into your gas pipeline. Um, now, the one that everybody touts is, well just throw down a cogen unit and create electricity. Well in Alberta, there never seems to be a power line where you want to generate electricity. And in Saskatchewan, SAS Power and SAS Energy aren't on the same page because SAS Power doesn't really want you putting electricity into their grid. They've got some serious limitations on how much you can put in and where and this and that. And it causes them more of a headache than it's worth is what I got from the discussion. So the other time when you could use these because it's skill mount, skid mounted, modular, portable, is you could use this for temporary operations. Um, we know that the government restricts how much flaring you can do during your cleanup operations. 72 hours, uh, maximum flaring, there's so much maximum gas you can flare during those operations. 
Sometimes it's not enough. You talk to your reservoir engineer, he always wants a longer drawdown so he can get that nice curve build up so he can see the boundaries and everything else. Um, and in BC, if I understood the regulations correctly, if you're within 1.5 kilometers of an existing pipe, you have to put a temporary pipeline in place in order to test your well, your catch flare. So this is a great opportunity to uh, bring these vessels in. You set them down, you've got your testers there, the gas instead of going to flare goes into these vessels, and you're producing product while you're testing your well. Um, and the other time you could use it is if you know that you're going to put a pipeline here, but breakup hits you soon and uh, you're not going to get that pipe in the ground until next fall, you could set this in conjunction with a single wall battery and produce the well six months earlier instead of waiting for the pipe. All right, this is a very, very flexible design. The actual catalyst, single vessel catalyst, can go on one skid, have pressure in, product out. Now what we do after that is plug and play. If you have existing compression on site, we use it. If you have an existing separator on site, we use it. If, you need, if we need a separator at the end of the product, you've got one in storage, slide it in, and as long as it meets the pressure and temperature requirements, there it is. Um, so our inlet separator could be two or three phase, depending on what's going on, what you have for tankage on site. Um, if you need sweetening and dehydration, we can bring in the existing skids. You just bring them in, set them down. There's the little, um, <coughs> there's the ones that use the dry chemical, it's just little vessels, 50, 75 MCF a day. It's very economic, very easy to do. Um, compression, like I said, if you've got compressors, we can use them. If you don't have compressors, they're off the shelf. Um, it's mobile. It can be trailer mounted. We can put it in a skid. It can match to what's there. And uh, you know, if you think, well, yeah, you're <laughs> going to bring one of these in for uh, testing cleanup operations, they don't think anything of moving in like 40, 500 barrel tanks for frack water. So this is really no, no different. Um, <clears throat> this, this stuff is compatible with multiple geographic sites. Here in Western Canada, it's cold, it's hot in the summer, but I, there should be no problems with that. And then when we scale it up and go global, there won't be a problem moving it anywhere where, we need to, where the opportunities exist. And one of the beauties of this is there's no special training required. All the stuff that's on this vessel are the same dumps, control valves, pressure regulators that your operators already see. They don't need to be, well, they'll be need to train on like how it's supposed to look, but it's not like you need to be, talk to the patients as the scientists, they don't need to be a scientist to run it. Um, and that said, because this is all standard controls, your existing SCADA can hook up to it. So if you've got a SCADA system, you can just click this into that, that SCADA system like you would any other vessel that you bring in. Okay, here's the other beneficial considerations. LLR is a big thing. Alberta government has changed the rules. The rule change is hurting a lot of the very small producers. Um, with this, you'd be able to turn on an uneconomic gas well and take it off your deemed liability part of your sheet and turn it into a deemed asset. Royalties. The royalties are paid on the produced volume. So you're paying your royalty, if it's an oil well with a little bit of solution gas, you're paying your royalty based on solution gas rate, but you're selling your product as if it's oil. And uh, reserves. Now all of a sudden, instead of flaring that gas, you're able to book it as reserves on your books. 